And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome to Grace Harvest Baptist Church as we come and we celebrate uh, another Sunday morning and we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 15, Matthew chapter 15, and we'll be in uh, starting in verse 20 today, excuse me, verse 10 today and reading down through verse 20. And I, I titled this sermon, The Heart of the Issue, The Heart of the Issue. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we as Christians understand that without Christ, we, we have a, our heart is rotten. It's rotten to the core. And, I, and uh, your pastor loves to eat apples. And, and uh, every, that's my breakfast Monday through Friday. Uh, when I come up here to church, I, I grab out of the... Out of the produce drawer, I grab a green apple and a red apple. And whatever other fruits in season, whether it's plums or peaches, uh, but I, I grab an apple and, uh, and I eat it on the way to the church every morning. And, you know, every once in a while, if you're not careful, you could find a worm in the apple. There's nothing more disgusting than when I'm on the phone talking to somebody, I bite down into my apple and there's a worm. But you know, I, I found something interesting this week. I didn't know this, but an apple with a worm in it doesn't necessarily mean it came from the outside where it dug itself in. Matter of fact, the worm doesn't crawl into the apple. Apples are not only the worm's home, but they're, they're supermarkets as well. You see what happens is that when a uh, worm is placed in the apple, it's placed when it's in blossom when the apple is developing. And so the worm is inside the apple, not working its way from the outside in. I didn't know that. I always thought they, they, all you had to do was look for a hole in the apple and then you were good to go. That doesn't happen until it falls on the ground. And I couldn't help but think, when you think of our own heart, you see, evil doesn't have to make its way into your heart. It's already there. As a believer, you were born with it. Just as that apple is formed, when you were formed in your mother's womb, you by nature of the first Adam were born into sin. And that sweet little baby that we see and we, we go, ooh, how pretty that and precious that is. Guess what? They looked at Nero that way when he was a child. They looked at Stalin that way when he was a child. They looked at Adolf Hitler that way when he was a child. They looked at the mass murderer, the rapist, the pedophile. All of them were children, babies. They didn't all of a sudden become wicked when they got older. That we were born with that. And, that. and before you think you're better than any of those, the Bible tells you clearly and plainly that you are just as depraved as any of those people I just mentioned without Christ. And so Jesus today, we're going to see where he gets to the heart of the matter here they see the heart is used in scripture as the most comprehensive term for who you are as a person when you see the word heart in scripture that's depicting painting a picture for us of the individual it's the part of our being where we desire where we deliberate and where we decide it's not the organ that I'm referring to. It's the who we are. It has been described as the place of conscious and decisive spiritual activity. The comprehensive term for a person as a whole, our feelings, our desires, our passions, our thoughts, our understanding, and our will are all at the center of a person described as our, the heart of an individual. I want you to think about that this morning as we stand and we honor the reading of God's Word here at Grace Harvest, starting in chapter 15 with verse 10. And he called the people to him and said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that this defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? And he answered, Every plant 
that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides, and if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. And he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. Father, we thank you for the reading of your words as you have just spoken to us through the proclamation of your word. I pray, Father, as this mere man stands before your people, Lord, that our hearts would be anticipating the truth of Scripture today. Lord, help us with our understanding. Father, for those who do not know you, Lord, I pray this is the day that that heart that is wretched to the core, Father, would come to saving faith, that you would turn a heart of stone into a heart of flesh, Father, that you would breathe life into a dead man or dead woman this day. And Father, you... We pray that you receive the glory for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. So we saw in last week's passage, uh, the Pharisees and scribes attacked Jesus about his disciples not following tradition of washing their hands. The, the particular tradition was the, the ceremonial washing of hands before eating. Again, the Pharisees were worried more about their traditions than they were about the commands of God. And God Jesus, the Son, put them in their place last week. So, the, so as we looked at that, and now again, he's getting ready to confront their hypocrisy, just like he did last week. You see, they were more worried, these religious leaders, these Pharisees, these scribes, these lawyers, were more worried about following the traditions that were in place, set by men, than they were about obeying the commands of God. We always get in trouble when we side with men rather than God. Don't ever worry about being on the wrong side. If God is clearly on this side, then you are on the right side, no matter how many people disagree with you. So we need to be careful here at Grace Harvest or fathers and mothers in your own homes with your own children or uh, adults in your workplaces or children in school we need to be very careful that we don't do the very same thing that we set up traditions that they supersede the commands of God and so this morning we're going to dive right into here and see how Jesus clarifies and goes right to the heart of the issue no pun intended through three steps he's going to go into the heart of the issue with three steps first we're going to look at the understanding and then the warning and then the explanation so in verse 10, we start the understanding. And he called the people to himself and said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles this person. So these people that Jesus called out had been watching and listening to Jesus condemn the religious leaders. That's where we are right now. So we so the religious leaders have been condemned, and Jesus is now speaking to these people. Now he wanted to expand on what he had just said about the unscriptural traditions and empty worship. Remember that? It was empty worship. You see, unless your heart is into worship, if you came here this morning, and you stood, and, and you with your fellow believers here, and you sang songs, but your mind was somewhere else, you weren't worshiping God. If, if you didn't have a desire to come, no matter what was going on in your life, to walk through these doors and stand up before a holy God and acknowledge Him as your Creator and your Savior, you didn't worship. And see, how many of us, and, and I'll be the first one to raise my hand. Even as a pastor, I have walked into these doors, sat down, be more concerned about something else that's going on instead of focusing on worship. We all have to be careful of that. And so, in order to avoid empty worship, Jesus is going to proceed to explain. 
hear and understand. Now, this was a common expression. Now, all I imagine is my wife grabbing a hold of the kids when they were little. I know it's hard for you to believe that Kathy can actually raise her voice. But I can remember her looking them in the face. Do you understand me, boy? <laughs> and believe me, they understood because mama wasn't far from her spoon or her switch. They knew what it meant to hear and understand. Jesus is getting their attention. Hear me. Focus on what I have to say. Listen carefully and play, pay close attention to what I'm about to say. Don't wander. Don't think about other things. Don't be distracted. It was not that what Jesus said would be hard to understand. He's not saying that, but that it would be hard to accept. There's a difference. There's a lot of things that you read in the Bible that aren't hard to understand, but they're hard to accept. Let, let's face it. Scripture puts roadblocks in front of us every day when we desire to sin against the Holy God. And whether you decide to stop at those roadblocks, evaluate what's going on, and to see which way you're going to go really determines where your heart is at that moment. I, I love it. You know, whenever you come to a decision, you go to a fork in the road. Like that, okay? If you take God's fork, guess what? You're going to keep moving up in the road to sanctification. Guess what happens when you take your way or the, or the world's way? It leads down. And then you're on that path. And the next thing, it's really easier. You're down here, and it's easier to take the world's way. And next thing you know, you want to know why there's no joy in your life. You wonder why as a Christian, why there's not joy. Because Christian, I will tell you this, when you belong to Christ, you will not have any joy in sin. Oh yes, it'll be pleasurable for a season. It'll be okay for a while. Sin is pleasurable or we wouldn't do it. I mean, how many of you wish that when you sin, God just put your hand on a stove? How nice would that be? Bam, that burnt, I'm never doing that again. But you know what the problem is? Satan knows how to turn that temperature way down. And what he does is he says, come over here. This is, oh, don't worry about what the preacher said. Don't worry about what the Sunday school teacher said. Don't worry about what your mom and dad said. Don't worry about what your husband says, your wife says. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about your godly friends. Just think how much fun this will be. Just think how much you will enjoy life the better. There's plenty of time to get your heart straight. And see, Christian, we have to be very, very careful that we're just as susceptible to that as the world is, except the world doesn't even have anything to convict them except getting caught see a christian we have the holy spirit that indwells in us that turns that temperature up as we continue to sin see it's not hard to understand it's just hard to accept the greatest stumbling block to salvation has always been the lack of acceptance of belief of the gospel not a lack of understanding it it's a lack of belief in it how could this be? How could this one man, how could you tell me that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and he would bother to die for me? Why would I want to serve a God who would do that? See, it's not hard to understand. It's just hard to accept. And so here Jesus says, I told you in verse 11, what goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean, but what comes out of the mouth, that is what makes him unclean. It's not too hard to understand. This was, though, a direct contradiction to what they've been hearing. This was the exact opposite of what the Pharisees and the, and the legal authorities have been telling them. You see, the Pharisees were saying that the matter before God, is, Jesus was saying, is not clean hands or kosher food, which is what they were concerned about, but was, Jesus said, it's a purified heart. If the Pharisees of Jesus' day would have reply to verse 11 they probably would have said something along these lines this is this is i can imagine how the conversation would have went jesus you have it the wrong way you're confused this isn't what we're this isn't right defilement comes from the outside not from the inside it comes from the outside it's what we eat that defiles us you said it wrong you said it in the wrong order i i do it every week i say last week i said stones instead of scones and I do it all the time. Uh, I say something I don't mean to say, and fortunately, uh, I'm corrected very quickly. <laughs> so you can see that these Pharisees were kind of like, if they had a chance, they would probably say, Jesus, uh, we, you just made a mistake. You, you don't understand. But Jesus 
is the one that was correcting them. You see, all you need to do is read the law to see the error of your ways. In Leviticus 5, God told us that we would be unclean, the Pharisees would have said. Just look at the law, Jesus. God told us that we would be unclean if we touch an unclean thing. In Leviticus 11, God told us of the foods that were unclean and would defile us if we would eat them. And throughout the entire law, Jesus, don't you understand? It is always the things that we touch and eat that make us unclean. Didn't you mean didn't that, isn't that what you meant? But the fact was, they should have known themselves better than anybody else the intent of the law. The teachers of the law should have known that because it is taught in the Old Testament, for example, in Psalms 24, ask in verse 3, who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? You know what the answer is? He who has clean hands in a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear swear by what is false what comes out of this man is what makes him clean before the lord see it's obvious from these verses that clean hands don't refer to the removing of physical dirt by washing ceremonially but to a blameless way of life flowing from a transformed heart and how does that happen how do we live How are we able to have a a clean heart? Because I just told you that we're born with an unclean heart, that we're perverse to our core. We 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 are not if left to our own devices, we will all ultimately always do what self-interest is for us. What benefits us above everything else? And so how how does this happen? How how do I have this transformed heart? Well, you know, folks, we were this morning, and if, you're not, if you haven't come yet, can, I, can, I, can, I, can you do something for your pastor? I would encourage you, if you're not going to Sunday school, to, to please come for the next six weeks. Yeah, uh, this morning, we, we started our uh, study in the American Gospel, Christ Crucified. And in the first session this morning, those who were here, you saw... I bet it was even a little bit confusing for you when you saw these people talking. Like, what what are they saying? How how can anybody who claims to be a Christian be saying they don't know what the gospel is? Well, folks, that's the core of our belief and why I'm standing here this morning. Why Grace Harvest is even in existence. Why you are here to worship. It's because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news that Jesus, the Son of the living God, came to this earth as a mere man and fully God at the same time. It's a mystery of our faith. 100% God, 100% man. And He walked among the people some 2,000 years ago. He he felt how you feel. He, He was thirsty just like you're thirsty. He would have had headaches just like you have headaches. His feet would have been sore. He, the Bible tells us he was tired. The Bible tells us that he, was, he, he, he mourned all the emotions that we go through. He went through those things. He was the perfect sacrifice, the lamb who took away the sins of the world, the one who knew no sin and became sin for us. The good news of the gospel to a lost and dying world, the only hope that makes a heart pure And transformed is recognizing that we are in need of a Savior that needs to save us from a holy God. And until we get to that point, our hearts are are darkened and and they're wicked and and we, we believe all kinds of nonsense. All kinds of things. I mean, you, you, you've, all of us have been exposed to it throughout our lives. I tell you what, at least you don't see it on TV as much anymore. Maybe it's because I don't watch TV, I don't see it. But you remember when they had all those uh, fortune tellers on TV? Remember? I mean, they were on all the time. All the time. All these fortune tellers. And, and I think one lady even had a show. I'm sitting there thinking to myself, what, how could people be so gullible? How can they be so insincere? But then I remember... I remember opening up the paper when I was a teenager. A paper. It's a newspaper. They used to deliver it to your house. <laughs> I rode a bike and I threw the thing on you. Okay, never mind. So you grab the paper every morning and I would read my horoscope. Oh, yeah, back in the 70s, we were cool. First thing out of your mouth, what sign are you? 
Please don't ask me that. But I remember, and I'd, I'd get that horoscope out every morning, and I'd read that thing, and I'd go, oh, I'm going to have a good day. Or I'm going to have a bad day. It's amazing what we put our hope and trust in when we don't know Christ. He gives us that transformed heart when, when you believe in Him, when, when you put your faith and trust in Him and no other, when you realize that God is holy and you are not and you need a Savior and you cry out to Him, Lord, I am tired of living this life to please myself. I surrender. I repent. I turn from my sins, Lord. Forgive me for them. And I know Your Son is the one who died for me. Every one of us here who's a brother and sister in Christ, we have cried that out to God. In some form or fashion, you might not have said the same words. You could have been like the thief on the cross. You could have, you could have been just like the thief on the cross. He did the two things required for salvation, did he not? He looks at, he looks at the other guy hanging after they mocked Jesus. Don't forget that. He was mocking him right before God changed his heart. And you talk about a transformed heart. He has done nothing wrong. The holiness of God. You and I, we deserve what we're getting. What did he say in that just brief little confrontation there with the other thief? I'm a sinner. He's holy. I'm not. I need a Savior. Jesus, when you come to your Father's house, will you remember me? And Jesus said those beautiful words. Today, today you will be with me in paradise. Glory. And you know what, Christian? When you say that exact same thing, when person here who does not know Christ as Savior, when you say that, there's not some big explosion that occurs. You didn't see lightning across the skies. We're not told that the angels started singing when, or excuse me, saying, when he became a believer. There was no earthquake when he said that. Guess what? It was just, Lord, I need you. I need you, but his life was transformed in that moment. Can you say that this morning? Do you have a, a pure heart that refers to inward holiness? It is what Jesus was speaking of and on the Sermon on the Mount when he said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Matthew 5, 8. Remember when we did the whole Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the pure in heart. Those who have been born again, those who have been made pure by the Holy Spirit, those who have acknowledged Jesus as the Lord, those are the ones who will see God. Nobody else. Clean hands refers to the one who is holy in an outward action as well as inwardly because he has been changed within. It is the exact opposite of what Pilate did, who although he washed his hands publicly, didn't he do that? Washed his hands. I am innocent of this man's blood. Matthew chapter 27, verse 24. Nevertheless, he was guilty in his condemnation of the Lord. He was guilty of violating the laws of Rome and going against what his conscience had already told him. How many times did he declare him innocent? Three times Pilate had declared him innocent. And he just washes his hands. Like somehow that would be okay. See, Christian, you cannot ignore what God has done in your life. You're called to live a transformed life. You're not the thief on the cross. When you were born again, God didn't take your life that very moment. You're here today. How does, how does your life reflect, reflect the transformed life? You know, God's people were more concerned with man's tradition and outward rituals than we were with inward righteousness. And we can need to be careful we don't do the same thing traditions and rituals require no change of heart no forsaking of sin no repentance before god you just just act like it it allows a person to display symbols of religion while holding on to their own sin this way of thinking and acting even affected the jewish believers in the early church who struggled with letting things go and most of you know where I'm going to go with this. Several years after Pentecost, Peter still could not accept the idea that all foods were now clean. It was hard for him to let go of the traditions of that he, and the commands that he grew up with. It required a special vision from God. And he instructed 
three times in a special demonstration of the work of the Holy Spirit to convince him that both all foods and all people cleansed by God are acceptable to him. And I tell you what, every bacon lover in here is praising God for that. <laughs> so Jesus is warning the people here and everyone else that hears these words to understand what truly defiles or corrupts someone is not what goes in, but what comes out. So Christian, what does your faith look like? What say you this morning? What, 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 does, it, does it look like what comes out of you? Does it look like you belong to him? Or is it all about appearances and making sure other people see that you're doing the right thing? What's coming out of your mouth? Jesus wanted to, people to understand, and now we see the warning in verse 12. They, then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard the saying? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has now plant, not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone, they are blind guides, and if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into the pit. So the disciples come to Jesus and wonder if Jesus knows what he has done. But you got to love this. Jesus, do you, do you know how bad you messed up? So let me set the scene for you. So from the Gospel of Mark, verse 7 and 17, uh, ver chapter 7, verse 17, he tells us that Jesus and the disciples entered into a house. Okay, so, so now they're into a smaller enclosure, and he tells, it tells us that Jesus, as he's in there, he points out to them now, away from the crowd and away from the Jewish leaders of Jerusalem. So now he's got his disciples with him. And the disciples ask the question, Jesus, do you know you offended those Pharisees and scribes? They came all the way from Jerusalem to talk to you, and you were, you were rude. Why didn't you, why were you, why did you act like that? You can see them now. And you must have, you, you got to feel Jesus' frustration here with his disciples. See, Jesus' statement about ceremonial washings would have cut away at the very foundation of the legalistic system that the Pharisees had set in place. And he knew that they would be greatly offended by it. He, Jesus, of course, knew that. Jesus was never concerned, though, about offending anyone. Let's get that straight. When it came to the truth, Jesus wasn't worried about hurting somebody's feelings. He had more concern for them than that. He wanted them to make sure they knew the truth. You see, how many times have you not shared the truth because you're afraid of offending somebody? For the, for the sake of peace within your own family, you just don't talk about the gospel anymore. For the sake of peace, you don't make any more comments about a sinful lifestyle. For the sake of peace, you just keep your mouth shut. You didn't have that problem with Jesus. See, the ungodly are always offended by the truth of God's word. The ungodly are always offended by the truth of God's word. Think about it in your own life. Think about before you came to Christ. And if somebody was to share something with you and, and you were living out, say, before you were a believer, and somebody who loved you enough to share the gospel came to you, say you were in college, and they're sharing the gospel with you and you're living with your girlfriend, if you're a guy, and living with your boyfriend, if you're a girl, or now the same, and, you're, and some Christian loves you enough to come share the gospel with you and says, hey, this is what, this is what God did for you. And that always begs the next question. So he wouldn't let me live with my girlfriend anymore? Well, it's not that he doesn't let you. It should be your desire now to live a holy life, pleasing to him. You see, when you get saved, you get transformed. The Holy Spirit that indwells with you makes you sensitive to things. Now, you're not going to get it all at once. And for the sake of time, I won't go through the whole illustration, but anybody who knows me and has been through my discipleship with me you've, you've you, and have even in the pulpit in the years past I've, I've talked about how we come to saving faith in Christ that 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 before as long as everything was legal we're on a super highway imagine out in LA and you got 10 lanes going in one direction and and everything's legal so you you're there and all of a sudden you get saved and you realize there's something some things I can't do anymore 
I just, I just know I can't do them. So you, you drop that lane down to eight. And then as you get convicted, as the Holy Spirit moves and convicts you in your life and you're constantly being transformed by the renewing of your mind and you're not conforming to the world anymore, guess what happens in that highway of your life? The road gets narrower and narrower and narrower. Not because some preacher tells you to do it. Not because your mother, your father, your husband or wife tells you to do it. It's because you get convicted by the Holy Spirit because you know why? Your mind's being transformed by the Word of God. And so what once was okay for you to do, you realize now that it's not. See, that we do not, if you're a follower of Christ, you do not get offended by the truth of the Word. You know what it does? If you're a Christian and you're a follower of Christ and somebody shares the truth with you, oh, don't get me wrong, we can have that initial reaction. I can't believe he's calling me out on this. How dare that person say something? But you know what happens at that moment or maybe minutes or maybe hours later? You start to fall under conviction because the Holy Spirit that indwells in you is saying, are you listening? Are you listening? That's not, you're not supposed to be participating in that, Mark. You're not supposed to be doing that. You, you represent Christ because a Christian will be miserable in their sin. They'll never be content in it. And that's a great way to this morning. If you're sitting here this morning and you're in a habitual sin, if there's no remorse or regret over it, you might want to evaluate whether you even belong to Christ. And if you're sitting here this morning and you're in sin and you know because you know because you know it's sin, you don't need to tell me. You don't need to tell anybody next to you. Tell God. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And when we do that, he separates that sin from us. Oh, you never pay the price for your sin eternally. When you die, you won't stand in judgment for sin. But guess what sin in this life does? It separates us from that relationship we have with God, our Father, just like a father on earth. When you're in disobedience to that father, the relationship's not the same. Not till you go to your father and say, Daddy, I'm so sorry you were right, I was wrong. And guess what a daddy does? Just like on the prodigal son, he reaches his arms around, grabs him and says, Oh, son, I love you. I will always love you. That's what God does for us. And Jesus points out here the hypocrites are destined for judgment because Jesus said, Every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant shall be rooted up. Those plants are the ungodly tares which God now allows to grow alongside the godly wheat. We saw that today in the film that we were watching, the video that we watched this morning in the Sunday school class. You saw that for 20 minutes. You, you saw people who professed to be followers of Christ, pastors who deny the gospel in progressive Christianity. Folks, those are these tares that are growing amongst the wheat. And by the end of the age, the tares will be gathered. Remember back in Matthew chapter 13? Gathered up and burned with fire as God's angels will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. And folks, let me tell you something. Those people that you saw this morning, if they don't repent, they are worse than any pedophile you ever knew or have read about. You know why? Because the Bible tells us those are the ones that lead people astray. And in hell, they have a special place. And that's just not Pastor Mark talking. There's, there's degrees of punishment in hell. We saw Jesus himself say it. You remember when he was talking to the people in Capernaum who rejected his truth? And remember, the rejection was just apathy. They just didn't care. They didn't do anything heinous. And, and what we would say was, was debauchery or anything like that, they just didn't believe. And Jesus said, you know what? It's going to be worse in the day of judgment for you than for Sodom and Gomorrah. Think about that. Jesus' most constant and repeated charge against the scribes and Pharisees was one of hypocrisy. It is spiritually dangerous to stay around apostates and others who steadfastly reject and oppose the gospel of Christ. 
If, if a brother or sister in Christ is in one of these people's churches, they don't need to be there. They don't need to hang around. If a pastor, if you were visiting this church today and this pastor got up and said to you, just like that guy said this morning, I, I'm not, I'm not going to let you put me in the corner and, and, and define what the gospel is. You better be running away from this church if somebody was to say that. You know, as we watched this morning and we saw this, this progressive Christianity, we see how people are drawn into this heresy. If there is opportunity to witness to them, do it. It should be done with, with the greatest of caution, though. You don't want to be debating these people. It's not your job to debate them. Leave them up, leave them up, leave those up that God has called to do that. Paul warned Timothy. He even said this in 1 Timothy 6.20, O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you, the gospel. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. What, the, what that is is a warning to us about us not even debating with these foolish people. You don't need to debate with them. You share the truth. You know, Jesus didn't debate. You notice that? He, he, when they asked him a question, he just, psh, he just told them what's up. So share the gospel with them. Pray for them. Exposing ourselves to such people and such teachings risks spiritual disaster, especially for the immature Christian. Did you see the testimony of that one young lady who, who she, the, the longer she stayed in it, and she was just confused. You know, the pastor invited her to go into the, 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 the deeper study class. And then, then he winds up saying, what does he say? She said that he, he basically said, I'm an agnostic. Remember, Jesus did not debate ungodly scribes and Pharisees when he responded to their questions or accusations. It was always in the form of correcting their doctrinal error and of condemning their spiritual and moral weaknesses jesus tells the disciples to leave these false teachers alone leave them alone those that will follow these false teachers will be led to spiritual disaster it's bad enough that they themselves can cannot and will not see the truth it's even worse that they would recruit others into their ungodliness see the pit that we see described here referred to holes that were dug in a field and these holes that were dug in fields and pastures, they would, be fill, they would fill up with water and these animals would come along and drink out of these holes. And a blind man walking through a field would do what? Obviously, he would fall into one of these pits. He couldn't see it. But the spiritual meaning of a pit is hell. That's what Jesus is saying here. The blind guides are the Pharisees themselves and the other blind are the converts so in our modern church today it's those who are falling right now for progressive christianity it started off as the emerging church the emerging church and now it is fully blown up into the heresy of the progressive christianity and that moves us to the third and final point explanation but peter said to him explain the parable to us and he said are you are you also still without understanding poor peter Here's Jesus again looking at Peter. Oh, man, are you not listening? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. See, do you notice that Peter calls what Jesus says in verse 11 a parable? He calls it a parable. Now, many of you, if you were just looking at this and you didn't understand what was going on here, you'd say, oh, here's another parable Jesus is teaching. This is not a parable. See, a parable was a story or word picture that Jesus paints, a snapshot of everyday life that he used to illustrate a spiritual truth. But Jesus' words in verse 11 are not a parable not a parable when jesus said it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person he he was conveying a spiritual truth 
No one would have walked away thinking that was a mystery. None. And yet, poor Peter. Well, it's just, just geez, why, you know, why are you teaching us in parables again? And you could see how he must have been struggling to decipher Jesus' hidden words here, but there weren't any. In reality, it was a hard saying, like I said before. It was not hidden. It was hard. Notice in, in, the, in the verse that Jesus expresses frustration that they do not yet or up to this point understand. What, what's wrong with you? It was as if they didn't have any excuse for their confusion and that they should have known better. It's been about two years now that they have been with Jesus and, and they had, after all, heard Jesus teaching on many occasions. I, I don't, for the sake of time, I don't have time to go back and, and, and recap everything that they have seen Jesus do and what he has said all this time. And remember the Sermon on the Mount. The, great, the greatest sermon ever preached. They were there. They would have heard Jesus in that sermon repeatedly point out to the outward external observance of the law and that the Pharisees and scribes had focused on and, and then hear him, he articulate to them the true spirit of the law. Matthew 5, 21. You have heard that it was said to, of, of, to those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is, in, is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment. That wasn't a parable. It was a truth. Or in verse 27 of chapter 5, you have heard that it was said that those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in her heart. We do the same thing. The same thing as Peter did. I can remember when I came to Christ. And I was thinking, well, as long as I don't commit adultery, I'm okay. But I can look at all the pornography that I want to look at. I can do all that. I, because I'm not cheating on my wife. Well, lo and behold, did Jesus tell me what? Uh, no, Mark, because what's in your heart is what defiles you. What you've already thought about You've already committed the act of adultery. You see, Christian, we are called to a higher standard than the world. As a police officer, I always remember this. And it, it, they, I was in Richmond City Academy in 78. I went to the Chesterford County, County in 80. I remember when I was an FTO and teaching the rookies when they were with me. When I was a supervisor, you're always saying that police officers are held to a higher standard. You're not the general public. You see, in the world, there are three types of people to a policeman. There's citizens, there's bad guys, and there's policemen. That's it. Three types. You all were citizens, except for the police officers here. And we were held to a higher standard than you were. You know, it used to be a time when I joined Chesterfield County Police Department that a police officer could not live with a woman. They were all men back there, except, except three of them. They couldn't live with a woman. Couldn't do it. And if you, they found out you did, if you went through the interview process, they wouldn't hire you. And if they found out you did, as they did one guy, he got suspended. Think about that now. I'm not talking, well, maybe some of you think that's ancient history. That was in the 80s. Isn't it funny how the world held God's standards 40 years ago? And the church doesn't even hold God's standards today. So Jesus clearly taught us and all those. His concern was not that the, we were mere external observances of rules, the mere letter of the law, rather that our hearts reflected the spirit of it. See, continuing with the figure of eating, Jesus said, do you not understand that Everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach as an expelled. In Mark's account, Jesus says, because it does not go into our heart. I love that he says that. That's Mark chapter 7. Those who are taking notes, Mark chapter 7, verse 19, in the same account, Jesus said, because it doesn't go into your heart. So what you eat is gone. You look, I know I shouldn't eat junk food. I love it. Okay? I always have. I always fight with it. It just 
It screams at me. These three musketeer bars are my favorite. Okay, the fruit drawer is on the left, and the three musketeer drawer is on the right. I know. Yell at me later. It's not good for us. And it can affect our health. If we don't eat right. But I'm telling you what, folks. God, God does care about what you put in your body to eat. I'm not saying he doesn't. But he's more concerned about what you're ingesting for your heart and for your mind and what you're doing. See, ceremonies, rituals, and other external practices cannot cleanse a person spiritually, and failure to observe them cannot defile a person spiritually. You're not more holy because you don't eat three musketeer bars. <laughs> Ceremony cleansing, even under the old covenant, never did more than picture spiritual cleansing. That's what it was. It was a picture of it. It, it was putting us towards Christ. You know, I, I love what MacArthur said the other day. He said, he said, too many people try to find Christians in the Old Testament. We ain't there. We're not there. The Old Testament was in preparation for the coming of Christ. I'm not telling you it's important. Every word of Scripture is important. But don't try to find things that aren't there. The principles are there for us. But when you, you want to know how to live a life as a Christian, open up your Bible. To, open up the New Testament. Read what Jesus, the Son of the living God, said and did and breathed. If you get too caught up, I've seen Christians that, that, that have reverted back to some of the trappings of the law. And that's the last thing we want to do. And look what Jesus says in verse 18. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and that defiles a person. Here we go to the heart of the issue. The heart represents, again, like I said earlier, the inner person. That's who you are, your thoughts, your attitudes. When I looked in Kathy's eyes and I said, I love you with all my heart. I wouldn't imagine this organ outside of my body and giving it to her. I was talking about my being, who I am as an individual. You see, that's our thoughts, our attitudes and our desires. But when the heart is filled with evil thoughts, it's filled with murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slanders, and other such ungodliness. These are the things which defile. I, I, I love parents when they have one child. It's their first child. I love talking to them. I, I've watched Pastor Jamie. It used to be the dogs. I don't hear much about the dogs anymore. <laughs> I don't mean to pick on you, Pastor Jamie. And then, then I've watched him as he, he was a daddy, and he's getting ready to be a daddy again. And I've watched that first child come along, and Piper, she's as cute as she can be, the, and the curly hair, and just a doll baby. But I, I kind of smile inside, and I, I know he thinks I tell him way too much, but there are a lot of things I just hold on to myself, and I'm going, you'll find out. You'll see what happens. But even that little girl one day is going to look at her daddy and tell him a terrible lie, a terrible one. And he's sitting back there right now going, no, she won't. <laughs> a child... And every mom and dad can say amen to this who has a teenager. will lie to you. <laughs> because well, you know why? Especially when they don't know Christ yet. That's what's inside of them. That's what. See, it was the Pharisees' inner unrighteousness shown in the extreme by their evil thoughts that to destroy Jesus that corrupted them. The, the central moral thrust of the Sermon on the Mount is that the basis of all sin is the inner thought, not the outward act. Murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders, and all of these sins begin in our hearts. The need is for God to cleanse men's and women's hearts, not for men to wash their hands. Paul warned Titus that rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the, uncircum of the circumcision, rather, must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things that should not teach. For this cause, reprove them severely reprove them severely that they may be sound in the faith not paying attention to the jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth you know why we're doing the american gospel christ crucified is because we're being obedient to scripture we're making sure that you understand what's on what's going on out there when a person is defiled on the inside what he does on the outside is also defiled but when a person is pure on the heart undefiled on the inside Matthew 5.8 tells us 
you will see God. Christians, as we see the storm clouds heading our way, open up the headlines, read your favorite news app, see what's going on around us. What's going to be our response to all of this that's going on? What is coming out of our mouths as a storm of oppression against what you believe is coming? Because it's coming. It's already here. What, what, what are you going to do? Are you going to get angry? Are you going to repay evil for evil? Are you going to jump up and down and scream at they don't have the right to do what they're doing? Let me ask you this question. Are you preparing and hoping for the coming of Christ? You see, Christian, God has done a work in my life. Because years ago, I was that guy that was always wringing my hands. But the, when he called me into the ministry, when he called me to shepherd God's people, he put this burden on me to get God's people ready. I would, for what? Well, Lord, I'm just going to be faithful. I'm going to proclaim the gospel. I'm going to, I'm, Lord, I'm, I'm going to try to live a life that, that they can look at and say it's not a perfect life, but that's something I want to imitate. I want to love my wife the way Pastor Mark loves his wife. I want to love my husband the way Kathy loves her husband. I, I, I want to love God's word. But, but as that went on, there was a transformation going on. I started anticipating the coming of Christ. You see, when a lot of people see dark clouds, I don't see that anymore. When a lot of people are, are, are walking around in fear and trepidation about what's happening, all I see is it's closer to God's return. And so how, how, how are you looking at it? Are you walking around constantly in fear? Wringing your hands like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Gas is up. Biden's an idiot. Don't laugh. No, 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 no. That's, I didn't mean it that way. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. We may not like what the president is doing, but he's not an idiot. He's the God, the God allowed that man to be in office. You never know, just to prepare us for his coming. And as you see all these things happen, the Bible tells us that Jesus is coming back. Too many of us live like he's not. Or you desire not for him to come back. You see, if you really want to know, if you desire to, to see the return of Christ, look within yourself. And see what's coming out of your mouth. And see if it reflects the belief that you're actually doing what Jesus said. Pray for his return. See, let me remind you that the persecutions of Christians for the past 2,000 years has increased. It's not decreased. I sent out, and uh, it's, on my web, it's on my Facebook page. If you're friends with me, you ought to go read it. Uh, watch it. It's a YouTube video of a pastor that's with John MacArthur, and he came out of China, communist China. Read that story. Listen to that story. Listen to what that man went through. Watch how his brother was killed right before his eyes because he would not forsake the gospel of Jesus Christ. And John MacArthur points out the persecution. He says, look at China, look at Japan. In Japan, we flooded it with missionaries. We flooded it with Christian organizations. And they are the most ungodly nation who doesn't know God at all, Christ. And you look at China, and there's hundreds of millions of Christians in China because the church was persecuted. It wasn't persecuted in Japan. It didn't grow. Christian, think about what's going on in the world Jesus continually preached that, that the kingdom of God belongs to those that are rejected by the world, rejected by them. Michael Moore said this this last Monday, 
Quote, they're religious nuts, talking about the Taliban. But we've got those here too, Moore said. But they said yesterday in their press conference that girls' schools are going to remain open. Okay, well, we'll see. They also said that they're going to operate under Islamic law. But that's exactly how a lot of Southern Baptists want to be, want it to be here too. Joe jo Ann Reed with CNN. This is the real life handmaiden's tale, she writes. A true cautionary tale for the U.S., which has our own far religious right, dreaming of a theocracy that would impose a particular brand of Christianity, drive women from the workforce and solely into childbirth, and control all politics. This is just the beginning, folks. This is what's going on in the world. They're, they're preparing for you to be the enemy. Don't act like it's something strange happening to you. Don't run and hide. Stand firm in the Word of God. Teach your children to stand word, firm in the Word of God. Because they, it may not happen in your lifetime, but then again it might. What will you do when the authorities come, just like they did for this Chinese family, and they, got rid, they hid the only Bible they had? They gave it to a neighbor so he could hide it. And the Red Guard came, went into the village, knew they had the Bible. They tore the whole place up. They beat his mother, and they beat his father. They told his brother to renounce Christ, and he wouldn't do it. And they beat him. They left him. He wound up dying from that beating. The father didn't go inside and get his AK-47 and shoot down the Red Guard. The son didn't try to take a gun away from those who were asking him to deny Christ. He just would not deny the Savior. Christian, I pray that it doesn't happen in our lifetime for the sake of our children. But don't be so afraid of it that you run away 